couple of themes through the literature that um, enable you to deploy Gaussian processes in particular, in particular areas at, at um, larger, larger scale than the vanilla method does. So here's a couple of sort of motivating applications for this. This is an example uh, of audio modeling, where this is an example from my group, where um, we're trying to use Gaussian processes to model audio time series data. So this might be regularly spaced data uh, that you might pull out of a WAV file. It has uh, a large number of data points, so 10 to the 5 to 10 to the 7 data points. You, you're, you're sampling this at 16 kilohertz, and you have several seconds or maybe some minutes of data. So you quickly get up to tens of millions of, of data points here. And we'd like to train Gaussian processes on this data. This is an example of some spoken sentences of speech. This is the waveform. We're going to use a Gaussian process to model that waveform, learn the statistics um, of the utterances from a particular speaker, and use it to impute missing regions. So you may hard find this hard to see, but on this plot below is about 15 milliseconds uh, of missing speech. And this Gaussian process model, which is fit to the whole speech waveform, is able to impute a guess, that's the, the red line, at what the missing speech looks like in that section. The, the ground truth is shown in black. It's doing a pretty good job. Here's another section where we've missed 15 milliseconds out, and it's able to sort of reconstruct that section, and a, and a third case below where it's perhaps doing less well. So we'd like to tra train these Gaussian process models on large time series data sets. Here's another example on the same vein. So this is an example of a Gaussian process model that's been trained on um, uh, sounds recorded from a camping trip. So this is the sound of synthetic fire. This has been generated by a model trained on fire sounds. And then you can hear my footsteps. So it's been trained on my footsteps. We're going past a stream. Um, then suddenly the wind gets up. And you can hear it starts to rain. Oh, it's about to start to rain, but I go into my tent against the zip. And then now you can hear it raining. So some people have come up with alternative explanations to what happens at the end there, but I'll leave your, uh, your mind to, uh, to figure that out for yourselves. But the point is here, we're taking a Gaussian process model. We're training it on. Uh, environmental sounds, you might call them sort of textual environmental sounds. The, each one of those sounds has of order 10 million uh, data points. Um, and then uh, we're generating new synthetic sounds purely from the generative model, um, from the learned Gaussian process model. And they sound to you like real uh, audio textual sounds that you, you might uh, encounter in the, in the environment. And you can use this to do smart things like removing noise from speech or removing wind noise from mobile phones, for instance, and things like that. So that's, a, that's sort of a, a motivating example. At the moment, given the current tool set you have uh, from, the, from the, the summer schools so far, you can't scale Gaussian processes to data sets that big. So we're going to need to uh, introduce some methods for doing it. Here's another set of motivating applications, a completely different domain now. We're looking at nonlinear regression, so something which neural networks are really good at, but Gaussian processes are also uh, really good at that too. And here I'm going to show a plot of performance of methods for lots of different data sets. So down here is one of the standard data sets called Boston. It has 500 data points, which are 13 dimensional. And over here is a data set which has half a million data points called year and 90 dimensional inputs. Okay, and we're going to try and do one dimensional regression in these sort of large data sets. And I'm going to compare how Gaussian processes do to, to neural networks. So this is the best performing deterministic um, neural network that we could find on each one of these data sets. And this is uh, what's called the held out log likelihood score. So some measure not just of how accurately you predict, but also how well you get your, your error bars. And here's the sort of the state of the art non-deterministic neural network method, so a method which uses sampling, or Monte Carlo, in computing its, uh, its estimates. And they tend to do a little bit better than the deterministic ones, but not in all cases. And here's a vanilla Gaussian process. So this is just a Gaussian process applied to these data sets. So notice in some data sets, GPs can do better than uh, neural networks. These are multi-layer neural networks, these ones, but a single, G single GP can do better. Of course, this involves scaling Gaussian processes to half a million data points and 90-dimensional input spaces, so you, you're going to need, it's not trivial to do this. 
And in fact, the purpose of this work was then to compare this to deep Gaussian processes. So this is a Gaussian process whose output then gets fed through another Gaussian process, who then goes through another Gaussian process, and so on and so forth. So the, the Gaussian process analog of a deep neural network. Um, and as you can see, the deep GPs in many data sets do better, so six or seven out of the, the 10 here. But fundamentally, one of the main challenges in getting all that to work is how, you, how do you get these, these Gaussian processes methods to, to scale such big data sets? So that's going to be the, the goal for the next hour and a bit, to talk you through. There, there are a whole slew of methods for doing this. And I've picked out probably the two most influential uh, ones in the literature, which we'll go through in some detail. Um, most of this is not my own work. It's, it's work that's been done um, um, by other people. So this is my take, my take on their work. OK, everyone happy so far motivation-wise? Any questions at this point? No. Um, do answer questions all the way through, because it will help me calibrate uh, what you do and don't know. You ha we have a very diverse audience here. I'm sure you've been told this before. But um, do not be afraid to put up your hand and ask a, ask a question. OK, so um, we're going to start with Gaussian process regression. Everything I say can be generalized to other settings, but we're going to start, as we always do with Gaussian processes, by looking at regression. And then at the end, I'll talk about how that can be how the techniques can be generalized to scale other, other uh, problems, like classification, for example. Um, so here is an example uh, Gaussian process regression problem. Um, I'm just going to get my notation sorted out, because you probably had to see 10 or 5 different people's sets of notations. So this is the notation I'll be using. Y is the output at any point. X, which in general is a vector, is the, um, uh, the input of each one of the, the data points. And in crosses here, you see the the data plotted in this sort of one-dimensional case. And one of the fundamental things we want to do from Gaussian processes is predict at an unseen input location what the value of y is likely to be. And of course, um, you've been uh, discussed at length how you can do that using a Gaussian process um, regression model. You put a prior directly on the underlying function that from which you imagine this data were generated. So that's the purple thing uh, that's behind the, the crosses here. And then you imagine that the da data are generated by taking that function and sprinkling some noise onto it according to a likelihood function. So that's p of yn given the underlying function f and the input location xn and possibly some hyperparameters which control things like the observation noise. Um, the covariance function also depends on hyperparameters as well, so things like the length scale in a, in a um, squared exponential kernel, for instance. Now, what we ideally want to do, of course, is inference and learning. So these are the two, the two fundamental operations that we want to do um, in pretty much any model. We want to infer the underlying function, given our observed data. And we also want to compute the uh, marginal likelihood for estimating hyperparameters, right? You're happy with this? Notice here I've separated prediction. This is maybe slightly different from some, the way some people present this. I have separated, usually you see separate steps for prediction and inference. But here I'm going to talk about inferring the whole underlying function in one go. And that automatically does inference at the data points and prediction for the function elsewhere. OK? A slight, uh, maybe a slight different from some other people. And as we said, this is intractable. It has order n cubed cost um, in general because of these matrix inversions or Cholesky decompositions that you have to compute. There might also be analytic and intractabilities too. And we'll talk about how to handle them as we go through as well. In particular, this likelihood function might not be a nice Gaussian thing. You might have heavy tails on your noise distribution. Maybe you have a student t uh, likelihood function, for instance. So that's another source, even in the regression case. Um, of intractability. OK, so the methods I'm going to talk to you about today use a really simple idea that maybe was obvious when we looked at this data that we had here. The, the observation is that, well, these data are like oversampled, to use a signal processing term. They're really close together. And it's kind of like a join the dots exercise to figure out where the underlying function is. So maybe what we can do is we can summarize our big ginormous 10 to the 7 data points by a much smaller number of effective data points, the green, the green guys in here. So we could take every tenth one or, or just make sure they're spread throughout the space, but sort of lump them down in order to, to summarize the big data set. And then we could fit a GP through the small data set 
And maybe if we sort of recalibrated the error bars, maybe that wouldn't be such a big, uh, a bad approximation. If we, the mean would be roughly right, right? If I, if I plotted a Gaussian process prediction through the green guys, the, the error bars are likely to be a bit too big because it thinks I've only seen 10 data points when really there were 100. So maybe if we calibrated the error bars a bit down a bit smaller, we'd have a great approximation for the, for the underlying Gaussian process here. Now that's sort of the main idea behind the um, approximations that um, we're going to talk about today. We're going to summarize these data sets by a small number m uh, data points. So capital M throughout will be the number of these pseudo uh, data points. Um, and the methods that I'm going to show you come up with really smart ways of, uh, of effectively choosing where these points should be in input space and where they should be in output space and smart ways to sort of calibrate the uncertainties so that the uncertainty you end up with is reasonably well matched to the uncertainty of the underlying GP. It's going to be more principled than just randomly selecting some, um, some subset of the points, fitting a GP through it, and then squidging down the error bars. It will do that automatically under the hood in a, in a sort of a theoretically well-grounded well way. OK, but that's uh, sort of the motivation for what we're going to do. Great. OK. Um, the literature here is a little bit hard to pass. So there's been a huge amount of work because it is one of the central limitations of, of GPs that needs to be addressed for practical situations. There's a huge amount of literature on so-called sparse GP approximations. And unsurprisingly, over the last 15, 20 years, the perspective of the field on those approximations has changed quite radically. And as with everything that's Gaussian, there are multiple different perspectives as well. You know, there are multiple different ways of thinking about Gaussian distributions. So, so reading and navigating the literature can be quite challenging, with each paper sort of capturing you know, the spirit of the time, and the spirit has changed over time. So I'm going to try and walk you through in, in sort of big picture terms what the trajectory of this part of the Gaussian process literature is. Now, one of the sort of first ways that people try to attack this scalability problem is a bit sort of counterintuitive. Um, here's what they did. They said, well, we have our nice, pretty Gaussian process model um, that we'd like to apply to our, our data, but that's computationally burdensome. So I've got a great idea. Let's forget about the model I actually believe in. Let's write down a simpler model which has some special structure in it, i.e. sparsity, which I can tractably fit to, to my um, data set that I care about. But let's calibrate that approximate model so that it's sort of roughly similar to the actual model I care about. Okay, so this is kind of a funny, funny spirit. I mean, and often we do this sort of implicitly, but here we're sort of making this uh, an explicit way of going about things. We've got the thing we care about, the model we care about. We're going to write down some approximation to that model, um, which is calibrated. And in particular, we'll talk about how we can calibrate the approximate generative model Q to the true model we think really underlies the data by minimizing some distance measure between those two objects. Um, and then we'll carry out and do sort of exact Bayesian inference in the approximate generative model. Okay, so that's the first, um, sort of one of the first veins with which people uh, uh, approach this uh, particular problem. And there are many ways of doing that. Not all of them involve pseudo data, this idea of using few, a small number of data points to summarize the, the big data set. But there are, there are approaches that we'll talk about which do both of these things. They use pseudo data and an approximation to the true generative process uh, in order to come up with scalable algorithms for deploying Gaussian processes. So um, in particular, I'm going to talk through the first half of this talk about a famous approximation called the Fitzy approximation. Um, by Ed Snelson and a, a bunch of other people um, that's sort of one half of sort of the main research in this, this area. Um, OK. Um, and there's a really nice review paper which takes this perspective um, called The Unifying Review of Sparse Approximate Gaussian Process Regression uh, by Joaquin and Carl Rasmussen. Um, that summarizes a huge number or a large number of models um, sort of in the middle here that take this, this sort of attitude to, to scalability. So I recommend reading the paper. It's a really, really good paper. The other side of the coin is a slightly different approach, which is probably more 
along the mainstream line of, uh, of standard approximate inference. So here the philosophy is different. The philosophy is we're not going to approximate the generative process. We're just going to write down the assumptions which we think generated the data. And then we're going to carry out all of the approximation at inference time. Okay? So we're going to keep our, our model that writes down the assumptions that we think generated the data sacrosanct. We're not going to mess around with it and try and approximate it. We're going to then try and form the posterior distribution the probability of the underlying function values given the, the data, and we're going to approximate that object using divergence minimization. So we're going to try and come up with some approximation to the posterior distribution rather than an approximation to the generative model. Okay? And that's much more in the, the line of standard approxim approximate inference. So you might have heard of things like Markov chain Monte Carlo or variational methods or EP, et cetera, et cetera. They're all doing this sort of stuff. They're making the approximations at inference time rather than um, uh, sort of messing around with, with the model. Um, so the most influential um, work in this area was done by Michaelis Titsiats in 2009. So this paper was about 2005, and then four years later or so, Michaelis came up with his method that was done in close collaboration with Neil. Um, um, and he applied a method called variational uh, free energy methods to, to solve this, um, or to come up with this method for scaling GPs. And that's really one of the methods which is driving a lot of the advances in the field of Gaussian processes at the moment. So that's going to be the second method that I talk about today. Okay, and we'll compare and contrast it to, to the FITSI method. Um, great. Um, I won't mention what these other ones are. However, I will sort of flag up. Uh, are, most, uh, are many of you coming tomorrow? Who put your hand up if you're coming tomorrow? Okay, good, excellent. So this talk is part of a double bill where today I'm going to tell you that this is rubbish and is doing something stupid. And then tomorrow I'll say, ah, <laughs> actually, there's a completely different way of viewing these approximations, which is actually as preserving the exact generative model and carrying out approximate inference at inference time. Um, so it turns out that you can also derive these models um, from an approximate inference perspective. Um, so tomorrow I'll, I'll sort of talk about that alternative view that um, perhaps uh, wasn't known until quite recently by most of the practitioners in the field. A few people knew about it, but not many people. Um, OK, so questions at the moment? If you have questions about the philosophy, now's a great time to, to ask questions, because uh, you know, the, the philosophy here really is important and the distinction between the two. So if the distinction is not clear in your mind, um, do ask questions or if you disagree with what I'm saying, that's also fine. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Um, so in here, there are definitely methods. So um, I guess some of the stuff that Simo Saka talked about yesterday. Um, you can view as approximating the generative process of the GP, but it doesn't involve pseudodata. So, so there are various methods which um, approximate the true generative process but don't use pseudodata over here. So you could, you could, there are certainly things which exist in this, this place. Um, there are methods that live in here that don't use pseudodata but use approximate inference. So I, uh, I, I don't know. Um, how much you know of the literature, but if you take the original work that was done on Gaussian process classification, the, the goal of that work was to deal with the intractable likelihood function that classification brings to it. And they used EP to approximate that likelihood function, but they didn't use any sort of sparsity in order to scale it. So there are a bunch of methods in, in here as well. Um, but yeah, we could populate, we could populate around. Yep? Is there any um, thinking about it in terms of how it, how it relates to the sort of classical sparsity approaches? Like compressed sensing and yeah, things like that. Yeah. Um, there's, there, there are. I don't know work about linking it to compressed sensing. Other people can dive in here if you want. Um, there's definitely work linking it to random matrix theory and um, like Fourier expansions, orthogonal random expansions, um, which is kind of linked to, to compressed sensing as well, actually. Um, and I guess that would actually fall in this part of the, the plot as well. So there's. There's like the Rahimian rect paper on using Bochner's theorem to approximate spectral spectrum of GPs, for instance. That that sort of falls in here as well. Yeah, I've not seen it linked to GPs, although someone can can link. You can. There's definitely Bayesian compressed sensing. That's definitely um, 
a completely valid uh, interpretation, but I don't know in GP land. Any other questions? Okay, there are literally th hundreds and possibly thousands of papers on this topic, so it's hard to, to get a completely uh, complete view. Okay, so um, I'm going to tell you about the Fitzy approximation first. So here's the flow. Just to recap, we're going to talk about this one from this perspective, the approximate generative modeling perspective. I'm going to talk about this one from the approximate inference perspective. That's our goal for the next uh, hour. And in order to talk about Fitzy, it's really helpful that you know about a concept called factor graphs. It's generally good that you know about factor graphs. So I'm going to give you a two-line introduction to factor graphs. Um, and then I'm going to ask you just to go away and solve a quick problem uh, based on factor graphs and, and Gaussians. So pay attention, otherwise you're just going to chat to your neighbor when we, uh, <laughs> when we try and do the problem. So a factor graph is a way of viewing a function. And it's a way of viewing the structure that's in a function. And factor graphs can be used because probability distributions are functions to view the structure in probability distributions. Okay? So here's, here's a simple probability distribution that's a function of variables x1, x2, and x3. And let's imagine for a minute that it just involves a single term in which all three of these variables interact with one another. So we can just write it down as a single function of x1, x2, and x3. That means the corresponding factor graph representation of this function is to draw the three variables with circles around them. These are called variable nodes. So here's x1 and x2 and x3, because they're the three variables that appear on the left. And then we draw a single factor representing the functions that were present in, in the probability density. So here there was just one function, g. So we draw this factor in here. And I could have put a little subscript g here to show you that it was representing the function g. And I draw a line to each one of the variables which appeared inside that function. So because all the variables were appearing together, um, we, have a, uh, we have all three being joined up. OK, does that make sense? Here's an alternative way. So may maybe someone says, oh, actually, uh, I don't need to group them all together in terms of a single function. Maybe I can separate them like this. Maybe the probability of x1, x2, and x3 can be written as the product of a function which just depends on x1 and x2, called g1, and a function which depends on x2 and x3, called g2. And the factor graph says, oh, I can, I can show you that structure visually. Let's write down the three nodes as before, x1, x2, and x3. And let's draw a factor here, which represents g1, and a factor here, which represents g2, and put in the appropriate connections. Okay. Is this, is this clear how to map from this decomposition to this thing? Yeah? OK, great. Now, the nice thing about factor graphs is they tell you about the con they can automatically read off the conditional independencies of variables directly from the factor graph. Okay? And the rule is as follows. If you can pick a set of nodes, so here let's pick x2, which separate all the other nodes in the graph so that there's no way of following the edges to the other node without going through the selected nodes, then you know that those two things are independent given the nodes you selected. So here, x2 blocks all paths from x1 to x3, trivially, because there's only one path. And that tells you that x3 is independent of x1 given x2. Okay? So you can translate quite quickly from factor graphs and the factor graph representation to the conditional independencies which are present in your distribution on the left-hand side here. So that gives a, a nice way of reading off the conditional independencies. Um, great. Questions at this point? Not so far. OK, so the, this is all a bit murky and mysterious. Why is it useful? What I want you to do now is solve this problem. So I want you to figure out what the minimal factor graph for a multivariate Gaussian is. So minimal here means I could have I lumped these two functions together and called it g and written down this factor graph. But it's not minimal because actually it decomposes this product. So this is the, the minimal factor graph for this, for this example. So I want you to write down, I want you to just chat to your neighbors, sketch on a pad. You've all got great Gaussian process, summer school paper that needs to be put to good use. So here's a great use for it. So we're going to think about this Gaussian. This is a four-dimensional Gaussian. X is four-dimensional four with a mean and a covariance. The mean can be arbitrary. And the covariance takes this form. And the precision matrix takes this form. Okay? So I'm going to give you those two pieces of information. That's enough to solve the problem. So you should be able to write down a graph 
some factor graph which represents the um, structure of this. Okay, I'll give you a couple of minutes. Any questions before we start? You happy? I'll walk around the room. You can grab me if you uh, if you have questions. But um, yeah, talk to your neighbours and. happy roughly <laughs> Good. just generally happy everyone happy here you does it make sense the question or okay so um, where to start yeah okay so think um, think about the form of a Gaussian distribution yeah that that looks like e to the a quadratic basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the form of that quadratic is like, um, what's my variable? X transpose times sigma to the minus one times X, roughly yeah, yeah. speaking, right? Um, so if we, if we wrote out that quadratic form, each term in the quadratic form depends on, because it's a quadratic form, depends on one X, another X, and then the corresponding element of the precision matrix sigma to the minus one, right? So we could write down as e to the a pair of x's times one of the sigma to minus ones plus another pair of x's to the next sigma to the minus one, so on and so forth. And of course, because e, e to the sum of things is equal to the product of e to the terms in the sum. Does that make sense? And maybe I have to write this out. But so that means you can, write, you can write the Gaussian as a product of terms which each involve a pair of variables. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. So it's a bit like case two here, that you never get all three of the x's sort yeah. of interacting together. Okay. So, so at most, we're going to have n factor nodes, square, square dark nodes, which connect to just two of the variables. Yeah. And now the task is to figure out which, which pairs of variables are connected, because not all of them are connected. Yeah. And that's why I've given you sigma to the minus one, and mm -hmm. there are some there are some zeros in there, mm -hmm. so some of those terms go away. Okay. So Make sense? We'll give it a go. <laughs> yeah. Hey. Isn't the inverse covariance matrix will give the neighbors the that's right. So you kind of just can use that. Yes. Okay. Yeah, that's right. Exactly. Yeah. So so the precision tells you about the conditional independences yeah. in your model. You can read them off yeah. directly from the precision matrix. It's a good way of getting intuitions of what precisions mean, basically. Do you need more time? Who's, who's finished? Uh, nobody. <laughs> All right, give you another minute. Who has questions? Who wants me to come and just tr talk to them? Yeah, yeah. Sort of. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do we need anything other than, than the precision matrix? No. <laughs> that's, a good, that's a good line of thought, yes. <laughs> There's a question over here. OK, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's more information than you need on the slide. Yeah. Uh, okay, let's uh, let's break there. Some people have got it. Some people are on the right lines. So, who wants to volunteer? Volunteer an answer. Yep, great. Oh, you want to, oh fantastic. Here's your pen. Okay. Wonderful. Okay. <laughs> So what, um, how have you, where does that come from? Just a bit more detail? Uh, it's correct, but... Uh, 
Ah, do you mean correlation? Do you, don't you mean this matrix here? You, you're, you've got your eye on this element, haven't you? Yeah. So this is the precision. This is the inverse of the covariance yeah, matrix. Inverse. Yeah, OK. Yeah, so we're going to, could you say why we're interested in this? This is unfair. I'm putting you on the spot, but it's fair. <laughs> <laughs> why, why have you ignored this? Why is this the important object? Carry on. You carry on, and I'll uh, fill in that detail in a minute. So, okay, so then we see that there is inverse, there is precision matrix between x1 and x3. Great. So we're going down this column, or equivalently this row. So we're saying there's an arrow between, uh, there's a factor node between uh, 1 and 2, and then 1 and 3. Yeah. And then there's a 0 here, right? Yeah, so we're not connecting x1 to x4. So we're not going to draw a line between x1 and x4. And then x, x2 is only connected to x1. Yep. x3 is only connected to x1 and x4. Here. And we've already taken care of this one because yeah. we've done all the others. Great. Yes. So this is the correct factor graph. Thank you very much. Perfect. Let's just talk about a little bit about why this was the right approach. So, th so the, approach, the approach distills down to looking at the precision matrix here. The, this is the covariance matrix. This is the precision matrix, the inverse of the covariance matrix. And the, the rule that we've come up with here, which is the correct rule, is to look down each column, say, and if there is a non-zero entry between each pair of variables, so this is the x1 column and this is the x2 row, that says if there's a non-zero in here, put an edge with a factor node in the middle of it between x1 and x2. And then put a, an edge between x1 and x3 with a factor node in the middle. Okay, And then do that across all variables. Why is that a pr uh, the right approach? Well, um, let's write out what this Gaussian density is and write it as a product of factors. Okay, So p of x here is equal or is proportional to e. I'm just going to forget about the normalizing constant. We're just interested in the dependence on x here. <coughs> Looks like this thing, right? And now I can expand this out. Let me use index notation to expand that out. That looks like e to the minus a half xi minus mu i, sigma to the minus 1 ij, xj minus mu j, sum over ij. Yeah, just re rewriting this instead of using matrix algebra, just using index notation. Everyone happy with that? And I can take this product out the side now, out, out the back end. So this equals product, with apologies to everyone over there that's probably struggling to see this, um, e to the minus a half xi minus mu i, sigma to the minus 1 ij xj minus mu j. And that equals, so each one of these things in here is one of our g's that appeared up here. Okay, so I can write this as a product over ij g i j x i x j. Everyone happy with that? So what have we learned here? Well, for the Gaussian, because it looked like e to the quadratic, we can decompose it as a product of factors g, which just involve a pair of variables. So there were no, no factors involving three variables here. You can't get factors involving three variables in, from a Gaussian. OK, makes sense? There are just pairs involved. And the pairs involved depend on the value of sigma to the minus 1. So if sigma to the minus 1 is 0, the factor just becomes equal to identity, and it doesn't depend on the value of x, i, and x, j. So any time sigma to the minus 1 takes a value 0, then that kills that factor in the factor graph. And you don't have to have all of the, the pairwise connections appearing here. Roughly make sense? Yeah. Great. Um, so what the reasons for doing this are twofold. Firstly, factor graphs um, make it easy to read off these conditional independencies, which is just useful to know about because they let you do uh, let you carry out computations more quickly. It also gives us some interpretation of the precision matrix here. 
you now know that if precision matrices have zeros in it, that means there are conditional independencies in, in your model. I, it's not a completely general uh, description of the variables. You are making assumptions about some variables being independent from, from other variables. And the third reason is what we're going to do in a minute is we're going to take covariance matrix matrices which don't have sparse structure, zeros in them, and then we're going to come up with ways of approximating these using more, um, precision matrices which have zeros in them, i.e. sparse structure. And that sparse structure is going to let you invert these matrices efficiently, effectively, because they've got lots of zeros everywhere. That saves you on computation. And we know, we know how to construct these by building conditional independencies in. Okay, so we're going to flip this on its head. We're going to build conditional independencies into our approximate generative model. That will lead to sparse structure in our covariance, uh, inverse covariance matrices, our precisions, and that will lead to efficient computation. Okay, roughly makes sense. Any questions? Don't be shy. Great, so I'm glad you understand that perfectly, or so bewildered you can't be bothered to ask a question. Excellent. There was the solution. OK, great. OK, so let's go back to, let's, do, let's carry out this process now. So we're going to take our original Gaussian process. Um, here is the factor graph. So remember, the full general Gaussian process will have all, all pairs of variables, sorry, all variable nodes will be connected to all others in a pairwise way. OK, that was what we, that's what we figured out down here. That's this result. So here's the factor graph for um, a Gaussian process projected down to just one, two, three variables. And I'm going to call the number of variables t, because I'm still thinking of this time series example to start with, where we were trying to scale Gaussian processes to long time, time series. So that's why this is t, usually called n. Um, and we're going, to carry, we're, going to, we're going to carry out this sparsification process in two steps. OK? Um, the first step is to augment the model with m pseudo data points. Okay? These are these additional data points that we're going to use to summarize the, the, the actual data. And we're going, to, we're going to use fewer of them than the total amount of data we've got, because we want to summarize the total da data we've got with a small number of uh, pseudo points. So m is smaller than t. And we're going to write down the multivariate Gaussian over f and u under our Gaussian uh, Gaussian process prior. So, and for simplicity, I'm going to imagine that prior has zero mean. Most of the stuff you've looked at probably has zero mean here. So we've got a multivariate Gaussian over the combined variables f and u. We've got the covariance between the f's. We've got the cross covariance between u and f and f and u. And we've got the covariance over the u's. Okay? And this will all be completely correlated in a normal Gaussian process. Yeah? This makes sense? So this is exactly like... Um, in a normal Gaussian process regression context, you might have t observations of the underlying function, and then you might want to make predictions at m other points. And if you were carrying out that computation, you'd want to write down the joint multivariate Gaussian over the t uh, observed function values and the m points which you want to predict at. This is nothing more than, than that. It's exactly the same object here. It's the, it's the Gaussian prior over all of those points. OK, everyone happy so far? Great. Now what we're going to do is we want to introduce sparsity, because we want to speed up the computation. So what we're going to do is we're going to go in and delete some of these edges in here, or, or in effect, introduce conditional dependencies, in, uh, conditional independencies into our model. And in particular, we're going, to, we're going to delete all of these direct connections between the Fs. So all of these links that are in here, we're just going to remove them and come up with something like that. Okay. The reason why we're doing that is now the f's are all conditionally independent from one another, given the whole set of u's at the top. If I take all of the u's at the top, that blocks any path between the f's, obviously, because the, we've deleted the direct connection, so they have to go through u's. And that means there's going to be sparse structure in our resulting um, precision matrix, which will facilitate uh, fast computation. Okay? And notice, too, this sort of accords with this idea that the, in, the uh, variables u, the pseudo sort of data points u, um, are going to summarize our data because f's can't directly connect to one another. They have to go through the u's. So the u's are going to be used to sort of capture all of the interesting correlations and dependencies between the, between the f's. 
Okay, that's the way they're going to end up summarizing the data. This is very high level and a bit wishy-washy, but I'll show you the equations uh, in a minute. Okay, um, so now we need to car carry out this calibration step. We've come up with a way of approximating or a, a sort of a functional form that approximates our original Gaussian process. It's to take the original, the original fully connected U's and then F's, which just depend on the U's. And now we need to take that sort of family of distributions and make sure it's something similar to what we started with. And one way of coming up with something similar to what you started with is to use the KL divergence. Okay? Do, does everyone know what a KL divergence is? Put your hand up if you don't know what a KL divergence is. Great. Okay. Um, somebody needs to remember the number 18. Okay. Great. Uh, 18, 18. All right. So this is this is uh, this is going to be very fast. Apologies. This is um, a quick introduction to the KL divergence. This is in the discrete setting. Um, so imagine you've got a, di uh, a pair of distributions over a discrete value Z, uh, of a discrete variable Z. Um, so Z can take one of K settings. Um, the KL divergence between uh, distribution one and distribution two is the sum over the settings of the discrete random variable of the first distribution evaluated at that setting of the random variable times log of the ratio of the two distributions. Okay? This is the the definition of the KL divergence. It has a number of important properties. Um, the first one is it is always greater than or equal to zero. Okay, so this thing is always positive or it's always non-negative. And equality occurs when P1 is equal to P2. So you can sort of see that's going to happen in here. If I, if I say, if I let P2 equal to P1, then we'll just get log of 1 appearing in here. And log of 1 is 0, and so we'll end up with a sum of 0 multiplied by this thing, which is just 0. Okay, so it's trivial to see this as a, uh, a minimal value where P1 is equal to, to P2. And you can prove that it's bigger than 0 everywhere else, either by taking the first and then the second derivative and showing that it's got a sort of positive curvature. Um, or you can use a thing called Jensen's inequality, which... I've ref referenced here, but just take it as red. It's, it's non-zero everywhere else. One other thing to notice is it's non-symmetric. So it's not true that the KL divergence between P1 and P2 is equal to the KL divergence between P2 and P1. You can't just flip the arguments. So this is why, although it has this attractive property which makes you think it's something like a distance between two probability distributions because it's zero when the two distributions are equal and it's it gets bigger, sort of the more different they get. It's always positive. It's not symmetric, and so it's not really like a distance function. But you can think of it a bit like a distance function. Yep. Um, how about the triangle it does not obey the triangle inequality for for this reason. Yeah, exactly. So it's not a distance measure. There are there are divergences which are valid distance measures, but uh, this is not one of them. Um, in what sense? Does it ever have a, a, a peak anywhere? Uh, this other people will be able to come in here, but but. Um, in this setting, no, I guess. is the. Uh, it depends exactly what you mean. If you're unconstrained over your optimization of P2 here and P1 is fixed, then there's a unique optimum. And similarly, for the other way around, if you have constraints, then it will not have a unique optimum. Yeah. Does anyone else want to clarify anything I've said so far or add a comment? Yeah. Ah, you mean uh, if P2 takes a value 0 and P1 doesn't take a value 0? Uh, yeah. Yeah, great question. Um, so, so the uh, questioner is imagining that P2 might take a non-zero value in a region where P1 takes a zero value or vice versa. And from that, you can sort of see different properties of the KL divergence. So um, P1, if P2 takes a value 0, or a really, really small value, then you're going to get log of something really, really small, which gives you a sort of a big negative number. And that, in the limit, if, if P1 puts some, mass, puts some mass there, where P2 doesn't have any mass, will give us infinite KL cost. Okay, so this, this, the distance between two densities, if P1 puts mass where P2 doesn't put mass, that will be penalized infinitely. It's not true the other way around. So you will not get an infinite cost if P1 has zero density and P2 takes a really uh, big value or non-zero value because 
zero hits this thing and kills it. So that's sort of the source of this asymmetry, which I plotted at the bottom, but I won't go through because we'll end up spending a lot of time on it. But um, so, so in a minute, we're going to be talking about minimizing KL divergences in order to make one distribution similar to a target distribution. And you will get different answers if you minimize the KL divergence one way around versus the, the other. And one of the properties, one of the important properties here is this sort of zero forcing or the zero forcing property that if P2 has zero probability mass somewhere and you optimize P1, then it will also have to put zero probability mass in that space. So that's the zero forcing property. Whereas if you do it the other way around, you don't get that property. Okay. This is a, a lot of stuff, fast and furious. OK, are the people who didn't know about KL divergences somewhat happy? It's um, a, yep. Yeah, you replace this with an integral. You just need to replace it with an integral. Yeah, uh, I should also say this is, this is also sort of the mainstay of information theory. So if you code a distribution P2 using a distribution P1, this is the extra length that your message will be for coding that stream using the wrong density. So it's the number of, uh, it's the communication cost, the price you pay and the number of bits in your messages if you code according to the wrong density. OK, any other questions? So it shows up all over the place. It's really fundamental and really Im important. Great, OK. More questions? Nope. Cool, OK. What was the number? Brilliant. If you remember one thing from this talk, it will be where we broke to go to the back of the slide deck. Um, great. Good, OK. So here's what we're doing now. So we. We've taken, here's our true generative distribution. This was just our Gaussian process prior over our observed function values f and our inducing or our sort of pseudo data points u. And now we're going to write down our approximate model. Our approximate model has this factor graph, which I can express in terms of the conditional independencies. Remember, we said all the u's are correlated together because they contain all of the pairwise connections. So I can write that down as just q of u. And all the f's are conditionally independent given the u's because of this property up here. It's exactly the same as this property. So hopefully, all that work we did to start with should convince you that this is the correct way of writing down this joint distribution that we came up with here. Q of u times the product of independent ft's given the u's. OK? And now we're just going to optimize this KL divergence in order to find out the best fitting family within this family which has this sparsity structure to our original model. We'll do argmin over the Q of U's and the Q of FT's given U's. You do the maths, you use calculus of variations to sort it out. And pay presto, you probably get the result you assumed you'd get in the first place, which is that the optimal um, new prior on your U's is the true prior. And the ways way of figuring out what the FTs are, given the U's, is just to use their, their prior probability under the original model. So it's just the prior probability under a Gaussian, multivariate Gaussian distribution of the FTs given the U's. That makes sense, the original conditionals we'd have in our model. Questions? No. Nope. OK, so we've introduced the sparsity structure. We have removed by removing some of the dependencies, and now we've calibrated things to come up with this new model. Let's just um, uh, talk through this a little bit more. Um, I haven't put the observations in now, so let's put the observations into this new model as well. So this was just the, the graph we had before at the top. This has come up with a prior that replaces our Gaussian process prior with something more tractable and easy to handle. And now we're going to hang our observations off the bottom here. So this could be regression observations, or it could be classification observations. Um, and because typically in these models, in Gaussian process regression, the corresponding y just attaches to the, the function value at that point where you see the input, there's just a factor node between that y and that f. You know, it's not connected to any of the other function values. Okay, and similar for all the other observations. Um, great. OK. So. There's an alternative way of thinking about this model that maybe makes it obvious why things have become simpler to do learning and inference. And that is, all of these f's are just Gaussian variables. And we can just marginalize them all out analytically. 
because everything, everything's Gaussian in the Gaussian basis regression case. So we can, we can integrate out these intermediate things. And we get to a graph which looks like this. And we can just sort of push these up here and end up with a thing like this. And that says we can now think of our model as, our, uh, as being observations y1 to y3 generated iid, or sorry, no, generated um, conditionally independently from these u's. And so rather than up here, originally, in our original model, we had to deal with t function values, t Gaussian distributed function values here. Now we get to get, deal with just, of our, just our u's, of which there are m of them. And so all the covariance matrices involved will just involve m by m covariance matrices rather than t by t. Okay. Let's go through that in a little bit more, more detail. Let's sort of go through this, this process a little bit. <coughs> So we said before that Q of U is just equal to the prior, which is equal to a, a Gaussian over the um, pseudo observations with zero mean and the prior covariance KUU. That's just, just like it was to start with. And the conditionals, let's think about the form of the conditionals. So what do people think the expression for these things looks like? What is the probability of FT given U? Any ideas? This is, this is an object, or similar to an object, which you've met time and time again in the previous lectures. Anyone see how to write down that probability? What's, uh, what kind of distribution is it? What family does it belong to? Wild guess, anyone? Gaussian, brilliant. <laughs> Gaussian is... In the, in the Gaussian process summer school, that's the only answer if someone asks you what distribution. It means I've, I've, uh, I've, I've set the bar incredibly low by asking that question. Um, OK, so it's a Gaussian distribution. So this, this to remind you, is, is just, um, oh, I've got it up here, is just the conditional distribution of FT given you under the Gaussian process prior. OK, so this, this is, um, imagine you're trying to make prediction from a Gaussian process. You say, I'm interested in the value ft, and I'm going to give you the value u's. What's the form for that predictive distribution of an ft given the u's? Do you remember? Do you remember what the mean looks like, roughly? No? Maybe I'll just reveal it to you. So this should be very familiar from Gaussian process predictions. Oh, here's a helpful thing. How do you make predictions? Well, the probability of y1 given y2 is given by a Gaussian uh, distribution in y1 where the mean has this form, remember, and the covariance has this form. Yeah? So we can just plug that into our expression above. So um, sigma 2, 2 here, remember, is the covariance of y2. The covariance of y2 here, well, the u's are playing the roles of y2, right? So in here, I have KUU for this one. And then this was the, the cross covariance between 1 and 2. That's between y1 and y2. So up here, it's the cross covariance between ft and u. So I just plug in ft and u in here. Yeah. And y2, as you say, is playing the role of u. So we have u here. And then similarly for these ones, we get the same thing. So sigma 1, 1, that was the prior covariance of y1. That becomes the prior covariance of the f's. So we just substitute that in there. That's how uncertain we would have been about the f's if we'd seen no data. And then, of course, we get a little bit more certain because we see the u's. So this minus some stuff over here is sort of the bit we've learned about the u's, the bit that has reduced our uncertainty. Um, and that has this form. It's sigma 1, 2, which we already talked about, times sigma 2, 2, minus 1 times this thing. OK, so it's just like reading off the Gaussian process prediction, prediction formula. OK, yep? That's a row vector, right? K, F, e, U is a row vector. Like That's right, exactly. So u is multidimensional, is m-dimensional, ft is one-dimensional, so you're right, that is a row vector. Okay. Yep, yep, exactly. And this is a column vector on the other side when I flip so the it's, indices. Okay. So yep. it's, a, it's a univariate. Problem. Exactly, yep, yep. This is all univariate because each one of the f's was conditionally independent, so we just need to deal with one-dimensional things here. Yeah, so, the, so that's important because notice that the only thing here, or the hardest thing to compute, is these inverses involving KUU. Right, so we're just inv we're inverting matrices which are now m by m, not t by t. There's no there's no inversion of a t by t matrix so far. We haven't finished yet, and there won't be. I'm gonna I'm gonna call this 
DTT for reasons that will come apparent. It's just going to do some bookkeeping. I'm going to call this here the um, uncertainty in F when we see the U's uh, that as a scalar DTT to do some bookkeeping. Great. Um, OK, so um, this is just finishing the specification of the model. This is just, got, if you haven't figured that out already, this is the prior on the U's that we've written so far. We've now written the probability of the F's given the U's, that was this section, and now we just have to write down the probability of the Y's given the U's, where we just take our normal, in this case, Gaussian uh, noise assumption that the, the data are generated according to the underlying function plus some Gaussian noise, and the variance of that noise are called sigma y squared. Okay. That specifies our new generative model. These are our new assumptions that we think the data are genera generated um, according to, and now we're going to do exact learning and inference in this approximate model. Okay. So that's, that's this view of doing approximation of the generative, generative model. Um, so it turns out the cost of computing the likelihood is now going to be order t times m squared, because we haven't had to invert a t by t matrix at any point. Um, but we do have to sort of carry out this ca computation in here. Um, so the overall cost is t m squared. For those of you, who, who knows about factor analysis? Anyone know about factor analysis? Uh, one person, so I won't bother mentioning that. <laughs> um, there's a connection to factor analysis here. I can talk to you about it later. Um, if we write out the likelihood, it has this form. We've got time to do this. Let's just quickly go through this. This will give you a bit more of a flavor of what's going on under the hood here. So this, this is, if you wanted to do hyperparameter optimization, this is the object which you'd now op optimize for your hyperparameters to do learning. Okay? And um, I'm going to talk you through where this form comes from, because it will it'll just sharpen up your Gaussian mass a bit, which is a useful um, exercise to go through. So. This distribution has to be Gaussian. Everything up here was Gaussian. Gaussian, Gaussian, Gaussian. And um, the only dependencies between these uh, different levels of the generative model were linear, right? The Fs linearly depend on the Us, and the Ys linearly depend on the Fs. So there's nothing non-Gaussian in here, as you, as you would expect, I think. Okay? So everything is just linear transformation of Gaussian variables. Yep, question. That's right, yeah. Well, you can always integrate out f of the generative model. Um, it gets a bit trickier, yeah. Maybe I should defer that uh, discussion offline. But everything I've said here can be used to scale the, the Gaussian process classification models as well, yeah. Um, OK, so everything, everything here is Gaussian and linear. So the distribution over the y's will also be a, uh, a Gaussian. The mean of the u's is 0. Notice? Yeah? And the f here just linearly depends on the u's. So what's the mean of the f's? Any idea? 0. Because a linear transformation of a 0 mean variable is still a 0 mean variable. And then the y's are equal to the f's plus some Gaussian noise. Again, a linear transformation. So the mean of the y's is also 0 in here. OK, so that's why this thing is, is 0. Everyone happy with that? Do you want me to write that up in more detail? Let's do the hard one. Let's try and figure out what this covariance is. If you can do this sort of maths, then it makes everything easy for you. When, or it's one of the sort of pieces of mathematics you need to sort of get comfortable with to do GPs. So let's work out what the expected value. Um, let's, let's go the whole way of the y's. Why do you want to do y's? Go on then, let's do the y's. So we know the mean, we know the mean of the y's is, is 0. So the covariance of the y's is equal to the expected value of y, y transpose. And we're, we're computing the expected value here over q of u and then our q of the f's given u. OK, that's the, that's the calculation we're about to do. <laughs> Happy at this point? <laughs> 
And that, so that's the, cheap, that's the shortcut for computing this. You don't want to go through and write down integrals involving Gaussians and try and solve those integrals and complete the square. Don't do that. That's going to take you three weeks to do that calculation. The quickest way to do it is to say, this is Gaussian. Let's just compute the first moment. We just did it. The first moment was 0. Now we're going to compute the second moment. And then we know that's the solution to this, this thing, rather than doing integrals over densities, which take ages, and completing the square. and. Ah, it's a nightmare. This is much easier. Okay, just compute the expected value of y times y transpose. Um, okay, so let's let's try and write that down. So that's the expected value. Um, let's just let's just handle this bit first, the first layer. So the y, y is equal to f at each of the corresponding f's plus sigma y times some noise. All right, you happy with that? A, an equivalent way of writing this distribution here is to say uh, y is equal to the value of f at each of those input locations plus some um, iid Gaussian noise. So the epsilon here is drawn from norm 0, 1. Identity. Yeah, happy going between those two representations? A few blank places, questions? No questions? Almost believe you. All right, it's getting, getting hungry. OK, so I can, I can substitute this in for y here and write this as f plus sigma y epsilon, f plus sigma y epsilon transpose like this. So I'm just substituting this expression in here. And now I have to also average over this thing. So I'm going to average over u, f, and the epsilon. And this thing is equal to the expected value over f, f transpose. That's just getting those bits. Plus sigma y squared i. Why did the cross terms go? Why was there not some expected value of f times epsilon transpose here? Yeah, because they're independent. The epsilon's a white noise, so I can just get rid of that. Happy with that, everyone? Great. OK, so now we're going to focus our, our efforts on this object. And let's just write that up down here. So notice we've, we've, we've found this bit of this long expression now. This bit has popped out, the, the, the observation noise. And now the claim is that this bit will give us this junk in here. OK? So um, expected value of f f transpose, that's equal to, well, we can use the same trick again. Remember that the f, and this, the, so these are the tricks you need to get good at. This f is given by this thing plus some noise times this thing. So I can write up, I can write up ft is equal to, uh, trying to look at this, k ft u, careful about this, this is a subscript. Um, KU u to the minus 1 times u plus, yeah, this is a vector, plus um, this thing, k, oh, I can call this d, right? dtt, this is this notation that this thing is called dtt times epsilon, where this, epsilon, this is a different epsilon, call that epsilon prime. OK, so f is just the linear transformation of the u's plus this diagonal noise. Using this makes it so much easier again, using this, this form of it, rather than using the density. Just use it as a linear transformation of Gaussian variables. And now I can plug this into here. So when I do, I can, I can plug the f into here and to f transpose. And maybe I'll, you'll let me skip a, a little bit of a step here and let me write this out as k f u k u u to the minus 1 u u transpose k uh, u f uh, 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 sorry k u u to the minus 1 k u f plus d OK, so, so this is formed by this times the transpose. The cross term goes, because u and epsilon are independent from one another. Um, and we get this coming out. 
happy, laborious, but hopefully giving you a feel for the mathematics. And now we can take this expectation in here and do the expected value of UU transpose. What's the expected value of UU transpose? Louder, sorry, I can't hear. KUU. KUU. Great. So I can just replace this with KUU. And hey presto, we've got here. Great. Yeah. So that uh, the reason why I go through this is laborious, but there are really long ways of doing these calculations that get you stuck. And there are shortcuts like this which get you there much quicker, and um, hopefully this is a helpful thing to do. Neil. That's that's probably true. <laughs> If only I'd been in that first lecture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so if you know the problem of Gaussian Gaussian, you've got P of X is a Gaussian that with mu and the variance sigma, and then you say y is equal to w x. Yes. Then you can immediately write down the result. Yes. And the result will be because the mean is zero, as you say, you get a zero. Yep. And then because the covariance is uh, uh, the, you know, you've got the other form there, and the covariance, you multiply, you get Yes. And then it's just done in one line. Yep. I, I mean, I've always taught these things like this. And it was one that I was, I mean, it's true that somehow that your way is more general, but for GPs. Yep. So, so I, think, I think Neil's saying I could have just combined all these linear transformations together and done it all in one go. Well, yeah, because you, know, yep. you know for a Gaussian the, what the properties are that an affine transformation on a Gaussian random variable will be Gaussian, and that's all this is, right? Th that's what I'm using. Yep. 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 Yeah, I don't think I'm saying anything different from that, by the way, but yes. Yeah, no, I don't know, I waste all this time. So this was obvious to everyone. <laughs> Great, I'm so happy. That's fantastic. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I totally agree. I totally agree. Yeah. All right, everyone happy then? So it's, it's crystal clear, obviously. Um, Good. And then at the end, I have just cancelled this thing with this one, and we have, we have this. OK, so that's the form of the, the, log, the likelihood. Notice, again, so the whole laborious big picture reason for doing this was this thing just involves KUU inverse. It does not involve anything, a t by t matrix that you have to invert any, any point. And so the cost is order t m squared. Okay. Um, so that practically, you can use the matrix inversion lemma here to to handle the inverses computationally quickly. That's where this, this comes from. But this is all due to the sparse structure that we've been, we've been talking about. OK. Um, great. OK, so any questions on that? I'm going to try and move on quickly to talk about the second approximation method. I'm going to give you a demo here. This is from Ed Snelson, who is the guy that came up and gave, uh, came up with this he was the second person that came up with this, maybe, um, but wrote a lot about it in his thesis. So here's an example. Uh, the purple dots are our observations here, inputs along the bottom, uh, observed values along the side here. We've initialized a Gaussian process with some hyperparameters. He set the vertical length scale to be really, really big, the length scale to be a bit too long, and the noise to be a bit small. That's why these error bars look a bit small at the moment. And it looks like it's too stiff and too, the length scale looks too long. And he's, he's had to put, so something I've swept under the rug so far is that you have to choose where to put your inducing point locations, where these U, U's live in function space. We have to choose some X's associated with them. But the tactic's going to be to splodge them down randomly to start with, and then optimize this quantity here the probability of the data, given the hyperparameters and the locations, the input locations of the U's, to make the data as probable as possible, as highly probable as possible. So we're going to optimize this with respect to our hyperparameters and with respect to these inducing point locations, which is called X bar. And to begin with, they're all bunched up. And what you're going to see is, uh, as we optimize them, they magically spread out and cover the space. And the amplitude comes down, the length scale gets a bit smaller, and we get a nice GP fit through the, through the underlying function here. It looks kind of sane and, and sensible, but we haven't had to do anything which was cubic in, in the number of data points. We just had a relatively small number of these U variables that we got to play with. All right, questions? Yep. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's a good question. It's a very high dimensional optimization problem because you've got, um, in general, you'll have to optimize each one of these, and each one of those might have multiple inputs if you have a multi dimensional input problem. So you're, you're talking about a big optimization. You've got relatively small numbers of hyperparameters, but you have lots of inducing point parameters to, to optimize, which might get you worried. So there are optimization problems potentially associated with this. But you can always initialize quite well by just taking a subset of your data as, uh, as your initial starting point. But there are local optima, and it's definitely not convex. And uh, you definitely. It can be in certain circumstances, subset of data works fine, and actually optimizing them can make things worse. But I think empirically, in most settings, I think it's fair to say optimizing the inputs makes things better. Uh, if you look at the predictions, the predictions get better. But there are problems that we'll come to associated with, with this. Yeah. Again, it's like a dark art. So you look at your compute budget, you figure out how long you're prepared to wait between fits, and, and you go from there. Yeah. Um, am I allowed to go over at all, Maurizio, or not? Mm. No, <laughs> that's fine if it's. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's true. They're going to kill me. Um, <laughs> I can well, I can very quickly answer that question with a with a plot. Uh, I don't want to go through this too too much, but here's here's your question: How do we select the number of pseudo data? Okay, so here's a here's an example with a very very long time series, and we're going to try and pick the number of pseudo data. And here's what happens if we, if we choose four pseudo data points at these input locations and we optimize them. Looks dreadful, right? And here's what happens is, and at the bottom, I'm going to plot the error versus the compute time. Okay? And the blue thing is the actual GP that we've managed to fit. So we've gone past 10, or coming up to, I don't know how many inducing points now. We're getting loads of inducing points. So. Did you, do you, what, do you see what's happening? So to start with, we're getting very long length scales with too few inducing points. We're getting the trend right, but we're not getting the wiggles. And eventually, as we, as we go past like hundreds of inducing points, we start to get the fine grain structure. And then around about here, we start to get enough inducing points to really trace out the function. So if you're just interested in accuracy, then roughly speaking, what you need is the same number of inducing points as you've got typical wiggles in your function. So for every typical wiggle here, Every wiggle, we need an inducing point, or maybe two. So in long time series, if, you, if your characteristic length scale is tau of your wiggles, you'll need big T over tau number of inducing points. And in this setting, that means M has to scale with big T. So you're sort of implicitly back to order T cubed here. Um, it could be, yeah, sort of the how do you how do you recover the original GP? Maybe you could use some of their math here. I don't know. Yeah. OK, does that make sense to people? All right, let's do variational methods then. OK, at breakneck speed. Um, oh, we've got, we've got a decent amount of time. OK, so fully independent training conditional before we go to the variational method. It is now parametric. We're now effectively fitting a parametric model. That was our, our P of Y. This thing down here is now a parametric model involving all of our input locations, like we talked about. So we sort of lost the GP here somehow. We're fitting a parametric model to the data. Um, it's a clever parametric model, because it's a bit like the GP, but it is a parametric model. Um, if I see more data, am I allowed to add new pseudo data? Well, from the generative modeling perspective, it is a bit weird, because you're supposed to specify what you think the generative process is for the data, and commit to it, and don't change it, and then do inference. Whereas here, uh, we, we, we sort of want to change it. If we see more data, we probably need more pseudo points, because there's been more structure revealed in the, in the, by, the, by the, sort of the, the observational process. So this is sort of a bit, bit weird. We've lost this separation of the model and what we believe in and inference and making approximations at inference time. Um, there are some extensions that I won't talk about. So the, the next method I'm going to talk about sort of fixes those problems, the first, the first two bullets up here. 
in a really elegant way. This is what McCarlis did and, and Neil has contributed to massively. And it relies on a thing called the variational free energy method. Okay? And this is a general method. I think this was originally developed by Feynman and colleagues. Um, and then has been brought over to be sort of very influential in, generally in machine learning. And I think the most successful application of variational free energy methods is exactly this. This is the thing which works best of all variational free energy methods, I think. Though Dustin might, uh, might disagree with that. For, for GPs, it works spectacularly well in general, I think. OK, so the idea is as follows. Um, let's take our log probability of our data given our parameters. And we're going to come up with a lower bound of this quantity. So this is the log marginal likelihood. I'm going to write that in red because it's intractable, because we've got too many data points, and we want to avoid uh, dealing with that. Um, and the, the way of computing it is to take the log of p of y given theta, and that's equal to the integral df p of y and f given theta. Okay? This is how you compute the marginal likelihood. You integrate out the, uh, the latent function values. And through everything here that I'm about to write, remember what we said to start with, the, the curly f is the entire process. This is the entire collection of random variables, uh, all possible input points. So it's actually a function. Okay, so I'm going to, really I should use measure theory and stuff like that to write this, but um, I'm not going to do that. You can just think of this as an integral over sort of a countably infinite number of variables in a way. That makes sense? So it's the all possible function values that we're integrating out here. Okay, so um, I can multiply and divide this by an arbitrary distribution Q that's non-negative. Okay? I guess non-zero in this case as well. So I'm multiplying and dividing by the same um, function Q. And you can use a thing called Jensen's inequality because using the convexity of the log to take this Q outside and replace log of an average by the average of a log. Okay, so it turns out that this will give you, this thing is a lower bound on this thing. And I'll actually prove that to you in just a second using the properties of the KL. Okay, um, so if you haven't seen this before, take this as red and I'll prove it's the case in the next line that this thing is indeed a lower bound on this thing. Okay, so schematically the way you can think about this, if we make a plot of, as a function of theta of the true marginal likelihood here, L of theta, the log marginal likelihood, and this quantity F, which is called the free energy, it looks like this. At any point in theta space, it, for fixed Q, it will be a lower bound on the true uh, log marginal likelihood, which is kind of a useful property. Um, so let's just see that explicitly, like I promised, by rewriting this in a slightly different way. So notice the form of this. It looks like the log of the joint distribution here over y and f divided by q. And I can, I can take that joint distribution and I can rewrite it using the product rule as p of y given theta times p of f given y and theta. Okay, this is nothing more than, the, than you know, the product rule. p of a comma b is p of a, p of b given A. Yeah. So that's just rewriting it that way. But the reason why it looks kind of different in this context is, hey, that's the true posterior in there. And this is the marginal likelihood, the thing we started with. And this marginal likelihood in here doesn't depend on F at all. That was the whole point in it. It didn't depend on F. So I can pull this outside, because when I do this integral, I'm going to get rid of that. So let me just let me see what I write, and then I'll see if I can explain it. Yeah, OK, let's, let me just prove that line to you. So we've got integral d curly f, q curly f, log p f given y and theta. Um, divided by q of f. And I'm going to use the additive property of the log log of a product is the sum of the two log of the terms. OK, so I've just, I've just taken this bit out. This bit does not depend on f. So 
this integral here will be 1 in front of this. So I can just remove this bit. Yeah. And then everyone will remember the slide we had on the KL divergence. We had a whole slide on that. This thing is minus KL divergence between Q of f and P of f given y and theta. This thing here. So, and the KL divergence was always positive. That's what we talked about at length, right? So this proves that the f is a lower bound on log p of y given theta because we're always subtracting off it this KL and that means it will bring it down below that line and um, yeah there we go that sort of proves proven the quantity you want again I'm being a bit naughty here this is the KL divergence now between two stochastic processes between Q of f and the, the true posterior so uh, again to do it rigorously you need to invoke more serious mathematics than I'm capable of but um, it all goes through. Okay, so, right, we're, we're getting somewhere now, almost done. So what we're going to do is we're going to now, so far I've just written down something very general, okay? In fact, the optimal solution to this problem, if we now optimized f of theta with respect to q, that would give us back the true posterior, because we know that the KL divergence is minimized when q is equal to p of f given y. So, so far we've done nothing useful. We're now going to be able to do something useful by introducing some special structure into Q of f that will give us sparsity through the idea of pseudo points, and that will lead us to efficient computation but good ways of summarizing big data sets. Okay? This is what Michaelis did um, with Neil, I think. So let's look at Q of f. Let's go into our big, uncountably infinite set of function values on the Gaussian process and split it into a finite dimensional subset U, which are going to be pseudo data that are going to summarize our real data eventually, and all of the other function values. So we've just partitioned the function into two, into two just disjoint sets, the U's and the function elsewhere. And now we can use the product rule to write down the Q distribution like this. And now we're going to make our assumptions. So, so far we've not made any assumptions. What we're going to assume is the relationship between the function values, not at the um, pseudo data, given the pseudo data, are going to just sit at their prior. This is a bit like we did in Fitzy, where each one of the f's was conditionally independent given the u's. Here we're going to assume that all of the function values not at the u's are jointly given by their Gaussian process prior. And then we'll let Q of U be free, the distribution over the um, inducing uh, the, the variables U be free, and we'll optimize Q of U. Okay, that's going to be our only free parameter to optimize. And because this is just a ga uh, an m-dimensional variable, we just have to invert m-dimensional matrices to calculate this. Notice this is not exact. So some people like this. Uh, have you really made any approximations here? This looks this looks like it should be exact. The optimal setting for Q of f of u given u, um, if we carried out the optimization, would be to say it equaled P of f not u given the data and u. And in particular, what we've done is we've stripped off the dependence on the data here. We said in the approximate Q distribution, this thing cannot directly depend on the data. The data has to enter through Q of u. So Q of u is going to summarize the data points, going to come up with a sort of approximate posterior distribution over the u's, and then we just use the prior to predict out to other parts in the function. So the u's are acting as a bottleneck for soaking up all the stuff that the data tells us about the function, and that's sort of how they're going to end up summarizing, summarizing the data set, because they're forced to by this approximation. Okay, This is pretty fast now, but we're a little bit running out of time. Um, so let's just have one more look at this. A couple of different pictures now. So Here's, here's one way in your head of thinking about what's going on. We've got this free energy f of theta, which is the log marginal likelihood minus the KL divergence between our approximation to the posterior over the process and the true posterior over the process, f. The true posterior is on the right here, shown in red. Maybe this is what the true posterior distribution looks like. On the left is our approximation, where we take Q of u and then predict out of it using the, the conditional approximations. When we optimize f, as we are going to do in a minute, for the um, q of u and for the inducing point locations, 
what that's going to do is it's effectively going to change this process over here so it looks as close as to one on, one on the right as possible. Okay? It's going to be trying to make this approximate process, given the constraints that we have up here, be as close to this true posterior in, a, in this KL sense. Um, great. And one way you can intuitively think about this is, in terms of these points U, is we're going to be wiggling around, effectively, the input locations of the pseudo data points in such a way that when we fit a Gaussian process to them, sort of again in inverted commas, it looks as close as possible to the thing on the right. So going back to this motivation we had to start with, that we want to summarize the posterior with a small number of data points. Here we sort of co we've codified what summarize means in terms of minimizing the KL divergence between the true posterior and this new one obtained from just this small number of uh, pseudo points. Um, Great. OK, notice here also that the inducing points, so the input locations of these pseudo data, I should call them, are variational parameters. They are things which just show up in Q of F. They're not anywhere else. They're not in our approximate generative model. The generative model is the true generative model. It contains all of the F values. But these inducing point locations, so the locations of the U's in here, are just a parameter which affects Q of F. In particular, it affects this conditional distribution in the prior. And so optimizing these things can never do anything terrible, because it's just going to try and make Q of F more like the true posterior. In the original Fitzy case, that wasn't true, because we wrote down an approximate generative model, and it could, have, it could have just tried to overfit the data by moving the input locations around. Whereas here, we're just doing, we're just trying, the goal of the inducing point locations is to approximate the posterior process. So it can it is protected against overfitting, in a sense, by this um, variational KL divergence. OK, any questions at this point? I've got one more slide left, basically. Nope. OK. Um, this is just the slide we had before. And I just want to show you that, that the free energy is now tractable. So one thing I haven't shown you, just to keep, keep the context in our mind, is I haven't shown you that this particular choice of Q distribution leads to a nice tractable F that we can optimize the hell out, hell out of using our favorite gradient-based optimization algorithm. So I'm very quickly uh, going to do that before we break for lunch. So all, that, all we're going to do here is we're going to substitute this form into this expression here. Okay? So we're going to take this and plug it in for the Q of F here and for the Q of F here. And this is where the magic happens. So here on the right, we get integral df q of f log. This is the um, probability of the model. And notice what I've done here. For the probability of the model in here, I've written it as the probability of the u's times the probability of the f not u's given the u's. This is just splitting apart the Gaussian process prior, like we did in, in Fitzy, actually. And then we multiply it by the probability of y given f and theta. That's our likelihood terms. And then we substitute in for the Q down below. And hey, presto, something magic happens. We've got this prior here cancelling with this prior term in the, in the top. So the prior term in the Q, this thing which we enforced into the Q distribution, cancels with the prior term in the model. And that's the infinite bit. So it's great. The infinite bit's gone away. This is the bit which involves countably, uncountably infinite variables. Those two things go, and we end up with something um, beautiful and tractable. Um, you can work this through, and you get this form now. With that cancellation, you get something which looks like f is the average of the like log likelihood over your q of f minus the KL divergence between q of u and p of u. And this is just the KL divergence between multivariate Gaussians, which is nice and simple. And this thing, if you're doing regression, the log probability of the data given the f is just a quadratic form. Uh, so the average of a quadratic form under the Gaussian is something which is analytic and, and easy to do. So um, you can go on further and optimize Q of U analytically. It has this form. It curiously relates to some of the approximations we've seen earlier and relates to the, to the Fitzy model without the diagonal uh, contribution. Uh, but I, I won't go much into this because um, uh, essentially 
you now know enough to go and read all the literature um, about variational free energy methods in, in, uh, in GP land. So summary of the variational free energy method. Um, we now have much better guarantees for this method. It can never take the pseudo inputs to silly places because they're variationally protected. Um, we're not approximating the generative model. We're doing all of our approximations at inference time. We're approximating the posterior. Um, so we've now separated modeling assumptions, which are sacrosanct, from uh, approximation methods, which are all done at inference time, which is fantastic. Um, and there's this useful rule of thumb, which we'll return to later, which is that if you want estimates better estimates of the mean function, you should use the variational free energy method. For reasons that I'll come back to tomorrow, FITC tends to give better error bars. Tends to be more care, care more about getting the error bars uh, correct. Um, and I already answered this question. OK, a few minutes late, but uh, almost brought you in on time. Uh, enjoy lunch, I guess. Or if you have any questions, uh, we should probably your questioned out. Any questions? Brilliant. Enjoy lunch. Have a good time. Mm -hmm.